Here we are. Happy Sunday. Let's worship. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. Oh, we shout out your praise. We sing. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Because he hung up on that cross. And he rose up from that grave My God still rolling stones away There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place We won't be quiet we shout out your parade. This we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise As we were the beggars Now we're royalty We were the prisoners Now we're running free We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace Let the house of the Lord sing praise Let's join Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout, we shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. Good morning, local church. Happy Resurrection Day. Woo! We are so glad you guys are here and chose to come and worship together this morning. My name's Whitney, and I'm going to be reading from 1 Peter, verses 3 through 4 and 8 and 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. In amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. 
Christ is risen from the grave, hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave.
Well, good morning, church. In just a few moments, we're going to celebrate communion together. Now, communion is a time for followers of Jesus. So if you're not a follower of Jesus, we're so glad you're here. But rather than partaking in the communion meal, I want to invite you to take this time and consider who Jesus is and what he did for you. This is an opportunity for followers of Jesus to express their faith and confidence in Jesus' work on the cross. That his body was broken for you. His blood was shed for you. We're going to celebrate Jesus' death on the cross, which washes away our sin, and his resurrection from the grave, which proved he was victorious over death. And so just in a moment, when you grab your elements, we're going to ask you to come up along the middle aisle and return along the sides. And if you're in the back, we have two tables as well. And if you're in the balcony, there are two tables on the, in the hallway. And if you're joining us from home on the live stream, we encourage you to take this time uh, to find drink and bread so you can celebrate with us. You may proceed. After Jesus died, resurrected, and ascended into heaven, um, shortly thereafter, the church began to gather together. And the book of Acts tells us all about the early church and what they did. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it tells us what the early church did when they got together. It says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. It goes on to say in verse 46 and 47, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the number, day by day, those who were being saved. The early church was devoted to the breaking of bread. And this is a reference to partaking in communion. And it's also a reference uh, to eating meals together. The early, early church, they, they gave themselves frequently to gathering together and they remembered the death of Jesus. A recognition that Jesus' death was a sufficient sacrifice to wash away all our sins. And a proclamation that Jesus' death is a victory over sin, death, and the devil. And we're recognizing, proclaiming, and celebrating the exact same thing right here, right now. 1 Corinthians 11 tells us that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we are grateful, we are thankful for your son, Jesus, that he paid it all at the cross, Lord, that we know that it is finished and that, Lord, he rose again victoriously thousands of years ago, proving that he is who he said he was. Jesus, we thank you for that. We thank you that your victory over sin, death, and the enemy is our victory, that we are cleansed of our sin because of what you've done for us. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your your name we pray. Amen and amen. Give life. 
And all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing God, we give you all the glory, all the praise, as we even draw these breaths now to sing, we recognize that they're yours, and no fear, no death, no attack can come against an awesome, powerful God that joins us today. Lord, thank you for your nearness, your presence. Open our eyes more, open our ears more, that we might hear, we might see. In your name we pray, amen. Man, you may be seated. Well, welcome to Local Church St. Pete and happy Resurrection Day. Thank you for joining us here in person, or if you're joining us on live stream, my name is Mark. And if you're new to Local Church St. Pete, we are so glad that you're here, especially thankful that you're here on this Easter Sunday. We would love it if you would fill out one of these connection cards. They look like this. You can find them in the back on the table. Um, you can also find them on the website. There's a digital version there under Start Here. It helps us get to know you a little bit more, know how to connect with you, how to serve you better. And... Uh, we're just excited that we get to be here together and celebrate the resurrection today. Now, if you have kids that are local kids, they were already dismissed at the beginning of the service, but if you didn't get a chance to do that yet, now's the time. You can go ahead and take them back. There are individuals at the, the local kids check-in that will help you with all the details you need for that. House groups are a vital way to get connected and to walk out this calling that we have to love, to serve each other, and to serve the community. And now is a great time to check out our house groups. Now, on the back wall, we have a map of St. Pete. We have dots where all of our house groups are. There's a QR code next to it. If you scan it, it's gonna take you to our list of groups. If you reach out to a leader, they're going to connect with you and give you all the details that you need to find out information. Also on the website under groups or on the Church Center app under groups, you can find out about house groups. Our next men's discipleship big meeting will take place this Saturday, that's the 6th, at 9 a.m. So we'll gather here at the building, we'll hear from the Word of God, and then we'll break up into small groups where we'll discuss it. It's also a really great opportunity to find other men who want to walk in the way of Jesus. Uh, from that, we can form discipleship groups, which are two to four same gender groups. And so you can find other men who want to encourage each other, stay accountable. So we, we invite you men out this Saturday for that. 
And if you've recently started attending local, then we want to invite you out to our newcomers party. And this is going to be a lot of fun. On May 5th, we're going to have this at the St. Pete Shuffleboard Club. So we love all of the, the new faces, the new people. We want to take some, just some time to be unhurried, get to know each other, hang out. Dinner will be provided, and then shuffleboard will follow. So whether you've shuffleboarded 100 times or never before, join us. We'll spend time together. You can find out more information and registration is available on the Church Center app. Darren? Well, thank you, Mark. Good morning, church. You all look great. I mean, really. I've got my festive black on. (laughs) Valerie's like, why are you wearing black? I'm like, babe, that's all I have, black and blue. But I got my white shoes on, all right? All right, my sneaks are saying, happy Resurrection Sunday. Um, If you're new with us, my name's Darren. I'm one of the pastors here with Local Church. It's an honor to have you as our guest. We're so glad you're here. I want to personally invite you to come to our newcomers party uh, here in just a few weeks. We'd love to just slow down, as Mark said, and and just, just spend time together over a meal. Um, and, uh, and get to know each other. It's very important to us as a church um, that we not remain uh, just a group of people, but that we press into each other's lives in love. And so that's, that's our desire. Well, if you would, open your Bibles, please, to Luke 24. It all seemed crazy. Totally absurd, like a fairy tale when they first heard it. Luke 24 takes us behind the scenes on the day Jesus rose to life. And in documentary style, we're given the unfiltered response of his first followers who are just trying to make sense of his resurrection. And as they move from skepticism to astonishment and from devastation to faith and panic to peace, we are invited to go there with them. Begin in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, And the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we we look to you. And we we give thanks and praise. Thank you for your word. It is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. And we pray that by your spirit, you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear all that you have for us. Lord, we pray that your word would take root and that it would produce fruit. That, Lord, you would be honored and glorified in this place. And that we would be transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, church, three points will help us walk through Luke 24. First, from skepticism to astonishment. Second, devastation to faith. And then third, panic to peace. First, from skepticism to astonishment. Three days after Jesus' death, a small group of women are on their way to anoint Jesus' body to honor him in his death, and they can't find it. They go to the tomb, they find the stone is rolled away, they encounter two men in dazzling apparel, who totally freak them out, by the way. These, these men are, have clothes that shine like lightning. These are angelic beings, and they ask them, 
Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you? The Son of Man, and, 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 and that's a way Jesus referred to himself. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day, rise. And the women remember Jesus' words, and then they run to tell the others. But the disciples don't believe their report. It says their words seemed to them an idle tale. In other words, it seemed to them a fairy tale. I mean, just complete nonsense. I love the honesty of Scripture. I just love it. It's unfiltered. It doesn't hide the doubt in skepticism. And the doubt clues us in on a number of things. First, Jesus' followers, though they were told that this would all happen by Jesus himself, they didn't understand what he was saying at the time or what it all meant. And then second, their idea of what the Messiah would actually do and how he would do it, it clouded everything. See, they're thinking the Messiah, the anointed of God, the promised king, should be conquering, not dying. He should be seated on a throne, not hanging on a cross. Didn't make any sense to them. And neither did the report that he had, been, he had risen to life. They believed in resurrection, but they believed that resurrection would happen at the end of time. Add to that, a woman's testimony wasn't even allowed in Jewish courts. It wasn't seen as credible. And yet here is Mary and, and the rest of the women with her. They're the first to see the empty tomb. They're the first to encounter the risen Christ. According to John 20, Mary was the first to encounter the risen Christ. And they're the first to announce it to others. So here's a little side note. If the disciples were making up this story, they wouldn't have told it this way. I just love how from the start, right after Jesus' resurrection, he is overturning deep cultural prejudice and bias. He's challenging preconceived ideas and assumptions that his followers had come to embrace. And he continues to do that in our day. But maybe you've come here today and you're thinking, all right, it's a good story, but that's all it is. Well, you're in good company. Jesus' first followers were some of the first skeptics to the very things that he promised. His first followers were the first skeptics to the things he promised. And the truth is, we all wrestle with doubt and uncertainty. Every one of us in this room, we all wrestle with it. Oftentimes, though, that doubt and uncertainty can push us to look for answers. And maybe that's why you're here today. If so, I, I deeply respect you for, for being here today and, and, and pressing in. I believe that honest questions deserve an honest answer. And so I, I pray, and I've been praying for you, that, that you would receive the answers that you're looking for today. Peter is filled with grief. He had denied the Lord Jesus uh, just hours before. He's filled with sorrow. He's filled with skepticism and doubt. But what does he do? He runs to the tomb. And he can't take it. He has to see it for himself. And when Peter sees the open tomb, and he sees the, the empty grave, and when he sees the folded grave cloth that was wrapped around Jesus' head and face, off to the side, it all moves him from a place of skepticism to astonishment, amazement. It shook the foundation of his doubts. Verse 12, it tells us, he went home marveling. Now, we don't know exactly what was going on in Peter's head and his heart. Was it the fact that the grave robbers or supposed grave robbers would, would never have folded the face cloth that way? It could have been. The face cloth moved Peter. Were Jesus' words coming to mind that he had, he had proclaimed to his disciples uh, time and time again that this would all happen? I think that was there as well. But whatever was going on in Peter's heart and mind, what had, which has seemed absurd moments before, had become something else altogether. He didn't have all the answers. He, I'm sure he had more questions stirring up in his head and heart. But he went home filled with wonder and amazement at what had just happened. And so he was moved from skepticism to astonishment. Second, we see disciples moved from devastation to faith. 
Let's pick up in verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, well, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a, a, a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we... We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken? Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Oh, stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. And so he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon, to Peter. And then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. What's going on here? Two disciples of Jesus are on their way to a town called Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. Are they sad? Oh, it's, it's worse than that. They're devastated. They're totally crushed. All their hopes, all their dreams, gone. In verse 18, we find out one of them is named Cleopas, and he's with a friend, likely his wife. They're walking together. I love how these aren't your high-profile disciples that we know everything about, and how Jesus just decides to step into their pain and sorrow, how he decides to walk with them in their devastation and confusion but he doesn't leave them there. They are confused. They don't get it. Nothing is making any sense to them. They're wondering, how could this have happened? How could this have happened? It wasn't supposed to end like this. In verse 15, Jesus says, drew near and went with them. This is so sweet. This is what Jesus chose to do after he is raised to life, to to walk with, to step into the devastation and confusion of two disciples. This is what he chose to do. It's just beautiful. So we get a picture of his character, of what God is truly like. And then verse 16, it's like the show Undercover Boss. You ever see that? (laughs) Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. They did not recognize Jesus. His identity is hidden from them somehow, some way. I don't know. Maybe he's got a hoodie on. I don't know. Uh, But he asks them, what are you talking about? What are you guys talking about? And they're like, are you the only one in, like, who hasn't heard of this Jesus of Nazareth and the things that have gone down in Jerusalem? You see, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel but they had just seen their hope nailed to a cross. And and, and they were still coming to terms with it all. But but here's the thing. Instead 
of looking to who Jesus really was. Instead of hearing what Jesus really said, they had been looking to a caricature of Jesus at best. They had been looking to a Jesus of their own imagination. They had placed their own agenda and expectations over Jesus, and they wanted him to perform for them. Now, they might not have said it that way, and we might not either, but it can happen to us as well. Are we following? Do we know the Jesus of Scripture? Not some caricature. Not some Jesus of our own imagination that we lay an agenda or an expectation of our own over and and then we expect for him to perform for us or to do for us what we want him to do. And if he doesn't, we're out. That is a danger still. And so what does Jesus do in the midst of that? He lovingly rebukes them and he graciously explains what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself that these things had to happen. They were absolutely necessary. I mean, look at verse 27. It says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Imagine the conversation. Now, Moses and the prophets, this is all shorthand for the Old Testament. The story of Jesus doesn't just drop out of thin air. It's rooted in Israel's story. It's rooted in the Old Testament. And so if you imagine a tree with its roots, the roots of the story of Jesus run deep into the Old Testament. The the whole story grows out of the story of Israel. They held this narrow view. These two disciples and the rest of the disciples held this narrow view of Jesus' rescue plan. They had limited it in their minds to national Israel. And we likely would have done the same thing. Here's Rome, the occupier. And here's the promised Messiah. Oh, he's come to deliver us from our oppressor. And then all of a sudden, you find that the occupier has just crucified your king. It was incomprehensible. It was unthinkable that the Messiah would be crucified that the Messiah would die a humiliating and shameful death. But here's what Jesus does. He meets them in their devastation and addresses their misconceptions with Scripture. That's what he does. He doesn't leave them in the midst of their devastation, and, and he lifts them out of their misconceptions. Has this ever happened to you? It's happened to me, like, again and again, and like, a whole lot. The Lord just meeting me in the midst of my own turmoil and devastation and fear and anxiety. Or the Lord meeting me in the midst of my misconceptions where I'm just wanting to lay just these these ideas over Jesus and have him perform for me and do for me my own bidding. But the Lord faithfully again and again just blows up those misconceptions and helps me to see what is true of him. And what it calls me to do, and how it calls me to live. Maybe it's happening right now for you. Some misconceptions are being exposed. Maybe you're in the midst of a place of real devastation and brokenness, hopelessness. But the Lord's meeting you right now through Scripture in that place. Jesus explains to them that it was necessary for the Christ, for the promised anointed one, the promised king to suffer and enter his glory, helping them make sense of everything that's taken place. Did you know that the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation tells one unified story that leads us to Jesus? That this library of 66 books, a number of different genres written over uh, hundreds and really thousands of years, this library is one unified story that leads to Jesus. And and like really a a string on a necklace holding all the beads in place, Jesus holds these stories together. Or like a missing puzzle piece, he brings it to completion. And that's the conversation, that's the teaching that he's having with these two on the road to Emmaus. And then in verses 30 and 31, 
This language is similar to Jesus' last meal with his disciples in the upper room, the night before he was crucified, where he breaks bread with them. Do you remember? When with the disciples, he said this, with the 12, he said, this is my body broken for you. We just celebrated it today. Jesus and his disciples were celebrating the Passover meal. They were, but he, he was directing them to not only the lamb that was, that was uh, um, killed in the place of Israel so that they would be delivered out of Egyptian slavery. Oh, Jesus was drawing lines to himself. And he knew where he was going, that he himself would be the lamb that was slain. And that's why there's a lamb there on that cross. The final, the ultimate sacrifice. No other sacrifice needed. His body broken for us. And so in this moment, as he's with the two on the road to Emmaus and they go into this home and he breaks bread with them, it says in verse 30, he broke it and gave it to them. In that moment, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared. And as I read this, I think, man, they fell back. They fell back like NBA players on the court side watching a slam dunk contest. Have you seen that? NBA players, they see a slam dunk, they're like, oh, they're falling. They're falling all over each other, even if they're sitting down. They're like, oh, convulsing. That's what happened to these two. Cleopas was convulsing. He was falling back. He was shocked, and so was his wife. They were just dumbfounded, but also their eyes had been open to the reality of who Jesus is and what he had accomplished and what his death and now resurrection really meant for them. And just like that, everything changed. What had been the saddest day of their life suddenly became the happiest. What they thought was the end of their hopes, the death of Jesus on a cross, was the fulfillment of their deepest longings. Devastation lifted. Gone. Gone. It changed everything. Do you remember the meal that Adam and Eve uh, had in Genesis where they partook of that forbidden fruit? What happened their eyes were opened. They realized they were naked. They, sin and shame entered our world, entered the scene. But here, with these two disciples, author N.T. Wright, he says, their eyes are open to the fact that the long curse has been broken. Death has been defeated. And they said in verse 32, didn't our hearts burn within us? Man, they were on fire while he opened to us the scriptures. Devastation had turned into faith, had turned into sincere trust and confidence as the truth of the resurrection and what it meant began to sink in. Has that happened to you? Is that happening? When they arrive back in Jerusalem, verse 33, they can't can't even get a word in. The disciples are so excited Jesus has now appeared to to Simon, to Peter. I just imagine these guys, they're like, he appeared to Peter. You know, just our Good Friday gathering, a friend of mine, we were talking in the back after the service, and he was like so excited for what the Lord's doing here in this community. And he was just like, God's doing so much. It's so awesome. He starts punching me in my shoulder. (laughs) I'm not going to call him out. He knows who he is. I just had surgery, rotator cuff surgery. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. God's doing a good work here, yeah. But that's how I imagine the disciples. They're just like, yeah, yeah. But they're also afraid. They're also afraid. And this is our final point, panic to peace. They're still trying to make sense of it all. Let's pick up in verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, boo. No, he didn't. Kind of feels like that, but that's not what he said. He says, he says, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. T- touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. 
And he took it and ate before them. And when he said to them, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. The disciples are still trying to make sense of it all. The Gospel of John tells us that they were behind locked doors, in hiding. They were afraid of being arrested and put to death. Fear takes many forms. From panic to anxiety, terror to dread, and and we all wrestle with it. Here Jesus is, he stood among them, it says. In other words, he stepped into their fear and he said, peace to you. Now this is a familiar greeting of the day, but this is declaration. When Jesus says this, he is declaring what he has promised. This is what Jesus promised and it's what they needed more than anything else and it's what you and I need more than anything else. Peace to be reconciled to the living God, to be restored, to be renewed. It's the place of real human flourishing. It's a peace that no person or no accomplishment can bring. A wholeness, a rest that is only found in Jesus. Here, let me show you Colossians chapter 1. Verse 19, for in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. How? By making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh. How? By his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. A new status, cleansed of our sin, welcomed into God's presence. It's awesome. We can't pay the penalty of our sin. We can't overcome death. But Jesus has done both. And that is what we fall on. That is what we rest in. That is what we celebrate with everything in us. That's what we're singing about. That's why we're gathered here today. Verse 38, Jesus meets the disciples in their fear, in their doubt. Why are you troubled, he says? Why do doubts rise in your heart? He appeals to their senses. I love this. He's talking to them, and so they hear what he's saying, and he says, now touch touch me. Look at my nail prints. Touch me. And then he says, do you have anything to eat? Not because he needed to eat. He wanted to show them that he was real. And then in verse 41, it says, they disbelieved for joy and were marveling, full of joy and amazement. You ever been there? Like you've seen something, it's so wonderful. You just "Ah, you don't know whether you should laugh or cry. You just can't believe it. (laughs) Maybe a, a, a family member comes in from out of town. You haven't seen him in... So long. You're like, I can't, I can't believe this. But you do believe it. But you say, I can't believe it. This is what they're experiencing. It all seemed too good to be true, but it was true. And that's when you know you're understanding grace, God's unmerited, undeserved favor and kindness, his love directed at you. When your response is, this is too good to be true. When you meet a Christian, a follower of Jesus, who's learning Jesus' ways, who's striving to walk in the way of Jesus, you meet a person who is humbled by grace and love, one who is standing in awe of the mercy they've received, one who believes but with awe and wonder, with joy and amazement, is like, wow, this is too good to be true. It's awesome. Verse 44, then he said to them, 
These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. It must be accomplished. It must come to completion. And I love how the NIV translation says it. Everything I told you while I was with you comes to this. This whole salvation plan from Genesis to Malachi points forward to what has just taken place. It points to a fulfillment that only makes sense when Israel's suffering and the world's suffering are taken on by Jesus. And what Jesus is saying here is it had to happen this way, and it just did. And then, verse 45, he opened their minds, and it all came together. It was the aha moment for the disciples. And and we're witnessing it as we read scripture. They had to come to terms with a suffering and a dying Messiah, a king who would take his throne by, by going to a cross. And we do too. We have to come to terms with that. Jesus went to a cross to defeat our greatest enemy by facing it for us in our place. Substitute. He received the punishment you and I deserve. Well, what does that mean? It means there's, there's no punishment left for us, for those who are hidden in Christ Jesus, for those who have by faith fallen on Jesus, who look to him and him alone. Our sins are forgiven. And that leads really to the why, the whole point of this story. Verse 47 This is all about repentance and the forgiveness of sins. What verse 47 is holding up is because of Jesus' resurrection, repentance or total life change, the turning away from sin and looking to Jesus and following after him for the forgiveness of sins has been made possible and is still available. That's what this is all about. That's the whole point. You're invited into this story. You're invited to embrace it and to proclaim it. And so my question is, have you embraced it? Have you looked to Jesus as your substitute, as the one who lived a perfect life that you could not live and I could not live and died a substitutionary death in your place? And if you have, are you looking to him to save you out of your sin and shame, who makes you whole and then calls you to live for his glory? Is that something you've done? You say, how do I do that? You you express this to him. Jesus, I surrender. Forgive me. I want to follow you the rest of my days. Thank you for what you've done for me. Make it your own. And in that moment, everything changes. Everything. Not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done. Have you embraced it? If you have, are you proclaiming it? This is our message to proclaim and to do it in the name of Jesus, he says, with his authority and power. I want to end with this question. Have you made sense of Jesus' resurrection? There will always be mystery to the resurrection. We'll never fully wrap our minds around it. But that doesn't mean that we can't know anything about it or live in the good of his love and grace or live in the good of what he accomplished for for you and me. Like, what are you doing in response to his resurrection? How is this shaping you? Luke 24 gives us God's logic behind the whole thing. The entire event is rooted in God's love for you. He's made a way for you to repent and find forgiveness of sins, to be cleansed, to be made whole. And so in documentary style, we're given this unfiltered response of his first followers trying to make sense of it all, trying to make sense of resurrection. And as they move from skepticism to astonishment and devastation to faith and panic to peace, we are invited to go there with them. Will you? Will you go there with them? Have you? Jesus is present here today, able to lift you out of skepticism, out of hopelessness and devastation, out of panic, out of fear. He and he alone 
is able to bring you to a place of wonder and faith and peace. He's made a way for it. Let me pray for us. King Jesus, we thank you for what we learn of you and your love here in in this, this narrative, this story. We're humbled by it. We thank you for the way you chose to step into the devastation, into the fear, into the doubt of your first followers, but that you did not leave them there. And we thank you for how you choose to do the same in our own lives. We give you praise. You are enthroned on high. You hold all power and authority. You have done for us what we could not do for ourselves. Help us to not only embrace this story, but to proclaim it all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and respond with a song. I want to invite you to come back. If you are a guest, next week we begin a new series in the book of Hebrews where we're going to learn who Jesus really is and what it means to endure, to press on and press through opposition and persecution and trials. We all face them. And we'll, we'll study that together. We'll explore that together. Thank you for being here. Let's sing. King is in the room. Come see the scars of love upon his hands. The king is in the room. We will watch the darkness flee at his command. Who is this king? Who is this king? His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Light of the world. There's freedom in his name. Awesome in power. Reigning forever. Light of the there's freedom in his name, I know there's freedom in his name. There's never been a love so great. He died so we could live, then he rose up from that grave. Name another king like this, now all authority forever belongs to him. He reigns in Name another king, oh, his name is Jesus, his name is Jesus, light of the world, there's freedom in his name, he stands so awesome in power, reigning forever, light of the world, there's freedom in his name. Say his name is Jesus, his name is Jesus, light of the world, there's freedom in his name, awesome in power, reigning forever, light of the world, there's freedom in his name, there's freedom in his name. We stand in freedom this morning. Pray that you go in peace and in grace. Carry the light with you as you go. If there's questions, if there's needs, come and seek out pastors. But everybody go and uh, be blessed today. Enjoy this resurrection day.